lies, deceit, betrayal, and the person you fell in love with isn't who you thought they were. An incredible story that we explore today, live. This is The Millennial Report. Live from the historic and world-famous Warner Brothers Studios in Los Angeles. The best of a generation has arrived. Stories that matter and people who are making a difference. This is the Millennial Report. Now, from the trending desk inside Studio B, here's Wade Heath. Oh, yes. Welcome aboard, my friends, from the same place where they film Ellen, The Big Bang Theory, and back in the day, step by step. That's right. We're right here in the shadow of Warner Brothers Studios uh, here in beautiful Burbank, California, for a live broadcast talking to you all about a story that if you haven't heard it already, will blow your mind. It's incredible, and our guest today is equally as incredible. But before we get to that, you are no doubt listening to us on the iHeartRadio app or iTunes, or perhaps you are over on ubngo.com and checking us out on Channel 2. That's right. Or maybe you are uh, watching us by chance. This is a digital broadcast, digital newscast. You can check us out on Facebook at The Millennial Report as well. Um, or maybe you're over on that UBN Go page and watching us there. Either way, we thank you for being a part of the broadcast today as we rail on through 2019. There's a lot to talk about today, a lot to discuss in terms of subject matter when it comes to... Um, almost sociopathic uh, tendencies of human beings. Uh, there is something really powerful today that we're gonna dive into, and that is um, a, a love story that's kinda sucky. A sucky love story, if you will. Uh, joining us today is someone who um, I started watching on YouTube over 10 years ago, uh, and uh, watched her collaborating with uh, many other people and being quite the uh, unique character in all of those videos. Uh, Brittany Louise Taylor is with us. Yay. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for being a part of the broadcast and thank giving up some me. of your time. Yeah, absolutely. You know what? I, I think that um, for anybody that hasn't heard of your book already, mm -hmm. um, A Sucky Love Story, Overcoming Unhappily Ever After, um, the cover can be quite deceiving. Yes. I, I, think I just I wanted a light cover because I feel like I'm a survivor. I'm mm -hmm. not a victim, and I've I, in my mind have overcame a lot. So I wanted it to be that this is the end result and not the beginning or the middle. Got so it. like in the end, I'm good. During the book, it kind of sucked, and I'm not that great. But like the cover <laughs> is a representation of me taking back my power, if that makes sense. I I get it in yeah. that context. Then absolutely, yeah. you know. And and when I first saw the the cover, um, I thought. Wow, this almost looks fun. You know, like <laughs> this almost looks like a little fun journey. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, I think a lot of people at this point have seen the uh, Shane Dawson conspiracy video uh, where he ended up talking to you. And, you know, you go ways back with Shane, yeah. um, back to the early days of YouTube and uh, before you, you both were uh, powerhouses in the medium. And you, you resurface in the Shane scene all of a sudden. Um, and the discussion becomes about this horrible thing that happened to you. Yeah. Um, that I think that if anybody hadn't been following you as an individual, um, probably didn't know occurred. And you've written a book about it, this book that we're talking about today, that really gets into the weeds of what happened to you and how. Yeah, I, I couldn't have easily like, it just, it, it would have been like a, a 24 hour long video. Like there's mm -hmm. no way on YouTube I could have explained everything so it's so complex. and. Even in the book, like the first half is just me if you, setting everything up, if that makes sense, because mm -hmm. there's so much you need to know for all the details later when I piece everything together. Sure. So some little random tidbits you needed to know to understand lies or deception that happened later on. Got it. You know, you're, 
uh, self-described the nerdiest cool person um, yeah, that <laughs> you, you might, someone might ever meet, uh, yeah. nerdiest cool person ever. Uh, on YouTube alone, her videos have amassed 240 million or more views. Uh, she grew up with her nose in a book, and uh, little did she know that someday she would be writing one of her very own that we are discussing today. Um, before this entire mess happened, uh, take us back. How would you describe Brittany Louise Taylor um, before said occurrence and, and story here? I think I was just a workaholic. So mm -hmm. I had moved to LA and I'm the kind of person I just kind of tackle everything head on. So I'm like, okay, I, I'm going to intern at a talent manager's office in an agency and I'm going to learn what their jobs are and I'm going to submit myself and YouTube, great, cool. I can make my own content and be my own boss. And I kept, I was so focused on my career that my love life never really blossomed because I just, you know, I had these dreams and goals and ambitions and I didn't want to be distracted by a boy. Mm. But I got to be 31 and I had, you know, gotten a nice little house and had money in the bank and a pretty steady career and I realized I was really lonely. <laughs> and I, you know, I'm not a person that goes out to bars. I don't drink. Um, I mean, I'll, like the few times I have drank alcohol it went really bad Not, nothing against people to do but i just i regress safe or not yeah to. safe yeah. or not too i'm the dd i'm always the one that just comes and tells everyone that happened what happened the next day or the historian and um i remember like you know being 31 in my house and going you know what am i gonna do to meet someone because I, I was at a point that i thought i could mm -hmm. you know find a relationship or a partner and I don't know if I was necessarily ready for marriage or a family, but I think I was ready and open to find someone. Mm. So I did what most people do these days. I signed up for Tinder. And at that point, there weren't a lot of options. Like mm -hmm. Bumble wasn't, I don't, like I didn't even know it existed if it did exist in 2014. Or most people in LA that I knew were on Tinder. Like I would go to an audition and I'd leave and then like, you know, I'd be swiping and there's the casting director like oh. on the app. You know, so it was... It was pretty normal for people to be meeting people on there and mm -hmm. I went on some, you know, bad dates and good dates and had a couple like boyfriends, mm -hmm. like short relationships happen from it and then I met Milos. Mm -hmm. So I, I think from the start he checked every box. I'm like, oh cool, like has a job, has a car, like, you know, works out, like nice family, like great. And um, part of me knew though, like from the start that something wasn't quite right. Like mm -hmm. I think my instincts and my gut were trying to warn me and I didn't really listen, but uh, he was just so cute that I was like, oh my, and he was a doctor and mm -hmm. had an adorable bulldog right. and an accent. And he, I, you know, I, I got sucked, I think, into the fantasy of what our, our life and relationship could be. Mm -hmm. And, and so, I mean, you mentioned there, uh, a doctor, he presented himself as um, somebody both very wealthy, very well educated. Um, the, coming the wealth from made a, me nervous, though. Like, I he bet, was from yeah. the first date, he was talking about, like, you know, oh, you know, we, when we take out the family yacht, like, it's $5,000 for the gas or something. Like, I'm like, who, like, that, that part I didn't like kind of turned me off. Um, but I mean, you can't really help how you were raised or how, like, you know, influential or affluential your family is. So I didn't want to hold that against him. But it wasn't until like date eight or nine that I started to like him when he stopped like, you know, trying to win me so mm -hmm. much and impress me. And I thought that I, you know, he switched and started to be in this like, you know, talking about his life or problems he had had or his family and opening up. And that's the part that I fell for. I mean, I just yeah. I just like the fact that he was educated and like had a job at a car mm -hmm. when most of my like exes like didn't have jobs for right. cars. And I, I always become a caretaker and taking care of people. And I just mm -hmm. wanted someone that had like their stuff together for once. Sure. So you, in the book, yeah. mentioned multiple times that, I mean, you're, you're kind of playing hard to get in the beginning. Like, Not on you're, purpose, though. Oh, like, well, it sure comes I off know, that way. I know, I know, but like, I think what it, I had just gotten out of a relationship with someone that I thought I, thought I kind of puppy loved, and mm -hmm. I'd never been in love before. I and see. he had broken up with me to marry a Russian for her green card. I, he texted me not too long ago and apologized. Oh my gosh. So like he read the book, but he's like, he's like, you know, you call me out of your stuff or whatever. That's another story. But like, um, <laughs> I think, you know, I I don't think my, my head was in the right place mm -hmm. when I met Milos. I wasn't in a strong place as I think I wanted to prove something and that's never a good time to get in a relationship when you know your heart's still kind of with someone else and broken you shouldn't be like someone else shouldn't come in and patch it like because your your instincts aren't always the best or you don't always make the best choices mm -hmm. when you're not stable yeah <laughs> it's best to just like wait until you're fully over maybe that person before jumping on to the next one because you know sometimes you don't make the best choices definitely 
Yeah. yeah. And so uh, in this process of um, playing hard to get, even though you weren't trying to. I wasn't trying to. Right? But it, it, it <laughs> certainly comes well, off that he way. Went, yeah. He was so forward, but it was like he kept asking me out on the dates for the next one or making plans, and I kept hmm. saying yes, and I didn't know why I was saying yes, and it wasn't... I was just uncomfortable, but I, I kept thinking, am I uncomfortable because he's just different than mm. anything I dated before? Am I uncomfortable because he's really successful? I didn't know what what my reasons were and why I was so, just having the anxiety I was having. When What was the point where you got comfortable? What it was about day eight or, eight or nine, and I was, like, I was like, nine. I really like him, and uh. I saw like a different side, and you know, from then, then we got really you know, comfortable really fast, and he would, you know, see me every, like, from this, like, when we started dating in July 2015, I saw him pretty much, like, every other day, or, like, you know, we, it went really fast, mm -hmm. so within a couple months, I was pretty sure I was in love with him, and wanted to marry him, and, you know, I was, I was ready for the commitment. Your story, I mean, it sort of starts out, uh, like other relationships with the pleasantries, the, yeah. the flirting, the fooling around, yeah. um, and that initial hesitation goes into now I'm comfortable, um, like you like you weren't entirely sold, as you mentioned. Um, later, you'd go on to find out a little bit more um, regarding his circle of friends. Yeah. Uh, you'd start to meet more of the people that he associated with. Um, tell us about those folks. Well, I mean, like I heard a lot about his family from mm -hmm. the beginning, and they were kind of against our relationship. So, but they were in Serbia; they mm -hmm. weren't in the United States. And you know, like anyone that if you went to another country, you probably surround yourself with people from your country or from your culture. So, he, all his friends were like businessmen or um, other doctors or lawyers or business owners or you know people that were kind of nefarious. So uh, he always surrounded himself with really powerful, like influential, wealthy men. When was the first time you uh, learned of his dramatic wealth? I mean, what he presents there in well, the beginning he, is pretty powerful. I mean, from the first date, he was telling me how wealthy he was, but then when we like got together, his oh. family cut him off. So they were giving him like 30,000 a month, and he said cut he- Cut him off. Cut him off financially. That's 30, what he said. Like, 30,000 a month. 30,000 yeah, a month. Right, like, yeah. yeah, like, and I was thinking, oh, well, how, like, you poor thing. Like, yeah, how right. you survive on right. 30,000 a month? But um, he told me when we first came, he stayed at like a hotel here in Hollywood for a few mm -hmm. months. And then, you know, when I had met him, he had an apartment in Beverly Hills. He had an apartment in Marina Del Rey. And then he was renting a house from his aunt in San Diego. And he had a nice Lexus. But when we got together, like within a short period of time, he was turning the Lexus back in. Mm -hmm. He, you know, he was getting rid of his places. And I offered for his dog first to move in, and then before I knew it, Milos was kind of staying all the time, and I, you know, got him to move in without even asking him just by the dog coming, so. And then the, the tricky part was once he ended up moving in, then, you know, he was teaching tennis lessons, but to be board certified in, in California, you have to have that, the, those credentials in order to practice medicine. Mm -hmm. And he was, he was, you know, certified in Europe, and, right. but he had to pass the boards here. But those, it takes a refresher course, and it's a little bit of work to be able to get the boards done. So mm -hmm. I offered to financially support him. I'm like, you know, he told me he needed two months. He's like, give me, you know, two months. I'm the one that really talked him into it. I was like, you know, I'll, I will pay for everything for two months, get your boards done, then you can get your residency going. And I wanted him to have that so he wouldn't be reliant on his family or whatnot. I wanted to help his dreams come mm -hmm. true. So... Two months turned into four, <laughs> turned into six. He kept pushing. I mean, he told me he had taken, I don't know if it was step three of the boards and passed it, which was like the in-person thing. Like, I even pretended to be a patient. Mm -hmm. Like, well, you know, and timed it where it's like 10 minutes they have to diagnose and, and whatnot. But he still needed to finish like step one and step two. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. So a very convincing story that he's trying well, I mean, he, yeah, and he, he told me, too, that he had yeah. gotten a job at the, um, they, they were going to give him a residency at the medical center in Irvine, mm -hmm. or it was, not, or, yeah, it was around the Irvine area, and he had, like, the ID badge right. from there, like, there was photos on his Facebook of him in medical scrubs, mm -hmm. and he was sending me things with him in, you know, in, it looks like a surgical area with, like, you know, scrubs on and the mask, mm -hmm. and. Yeah. So he moves in with you. Yes. Right. So uh, we're fast forwarding a little bit here, <laughs> yeah, but of course. Um, he ends up moving in with you, yeah. and you're smitten and in love, and smitten he's this kitten, yep. he's this dream guy, yeah. and he's beautiful, and you yeah. know he's got all these things going for him, um, and then one day you uh, see him take a call, 
yeah. where he gets very uncomfortable yeah. and um, starts to pace back and forth and then yeah. comes back to you uh, and starts to tell you that there's someone um, who is obsessed with him, yeah. a female, yeah. that um, is looking to sabotage him and blackmail him. Yeah. And um, take us through that experience. What happened there? I was doing a job for a, a, a big TV network, and I remember that night I had to go to the Magic Castle here in mm -hmm. LA and film. And so I was just like, you know, going through some notes, was like, you know, I, like production notes, like about what I needed to do or shots I needed to get. And I saw Milos take this call, and he, you know, I could tell was really upset, went to the other room, came back like white as a ghost, pacing, and I closed my laptop because I'm like, what is going on? Like, when you see someone that you care about get a phone call like that, you're like, some, someone died, sure. someone got hurt, like, what, you know? So he came, came in, and he proceeded to tell me that I was going to get contacted by someone, but don't contact her. She's just obsessed with me. She's a call girl. Um, she's going to say that we have a relationship. We haven't. Like, you know, basically, he, he laid it all out for me. Like, there's this woman who's been obsessed with me that hangs out in our circle of friends and has been after me, and I turned her down. So he told me the reason that, you know, she was trying to now blackmail him is because, one, he rejected her, and then, two, he found out about his family's money back in Serbia, and, um, you know, the, his, one of his good friends, when he was drunk, told her that he had given his last $170,000 to marry this woman here in L.A. for his green card. And he told me, he didn't tell me that he got his green card and was already married because my uh, hesitation with my boyfriend, when, remember when I first met him, I had the boyfriend that just broke up with mm -hmm. me to marry the Russian? Mm -hmm. He's like, if I would have told you that I would have done just the same thing, you would have never... And, it was a very messed up romantic gesture. Like in my mind, I was like, okay, so this guy gave his last penny to marry someone so he could stay in the United States and date me. Like it seemed romantic in a way. And he was very convincing, but the woman did end up contacting me. Right. She sent me two different emails with like text messages, photos, but he explained everything. He's like, you can go and you can take your computer and there's apps he showed me. You can put the date, time, battery power, insert text, photos. You can make it look like these text messages are really from each other. And he said the photos were stolen off his friend's phone. So any of the photos mm -hmm. of him, he sent to his cousin. So, I mean, it was all believable, but at that point is when our relationship started to break down a little bit because I think I, I obsessed about it. Like, I yeah. kept looking at her profile and thinking, she's gorgeous. Like, I, you know, if I was a guy, I'd probably want to, like, sleep with her. Like, mm -hmm. it, it just didn't, things didn't completely add up. So during this time, during yeah. the the whole explanation, yeah. in that in that it takes us back to that moment where now he's trying to justify everything that he just heard, um, and he's telling you this, and you've got your laptop, yeah. and you're sitting on the bed, and he's trying to 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 smooth this over before yeah. the storm comes. Um, were you were you in the mental capacity of um, I believe him because I love him, or was red flag starting to appear? Not, I mean, he was so upset, and his dog was just like licking him and licking him, and I like I believed him in that moment, yeah. and I thought like you know I would probably have the same reaction if someone accused me of doing the same. I would just be completely devastated and be like, you have to believe me. Right. He kept saying you have to believe me. He says I he says I promised you I will prove to you that she's lying. He kept saying that I will prove to you, you know. And then he told me that his family was going to take care of it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what do you mean? I'm like, you're, you know, your mom's business partner, like they have a furniture company and they do real estate mm -hmm. and whatever. He's like, no, he's like my, he's also very high up in the, like an organized crime yeah. thing in Serbia. So our mafia. So, right. um, I, th I think that that's a definitely when a relationship started to break down. Cause I was like, who am I involved with? But then at the same point I was like, you know, he chose medicine, chose a path of healing, He's trying to break away from his family, whatever their businesses may be. He can't help what he was born into any more than I could help anything. Mm -hmm. So I think I kept justifying things that I was in love, even though it's like you're not you're not rational when you're in love, mm -hmm. and you know you're not you're not thinking straight. Sure. But um, at this point, like our relationship was starting to break down in general, just because I was financially supporting him, mm -hmm. and he was not the nicest to me. Like that's really when like the verbal abuse started. And I started to, like, it was about March, right before I found out I was pregnant. I was like, why am I tolerating this? Like, I'm paying all the bills. I'm being supportive. And I'm getting, like, verbally abused on, like, a daily, you know, if not, like, every few day basis. Like, it didn't make sense to me. And I was ready to break up with him. And then I went to New York and was really craving protein. And I was like, <laughs> could I? And my, my period was usually, like, 
on the dot. So I was like, am I pregnant? So I ordered like 25, like, like, like packs of 25 pregnancy tests for Amazon. So I got home from New York. I go in the bathroom, like, and right away, each one was pregnant, mm. pregnant, mm. pregnant. And I was like, gosh darn it, because I, at that point, was going to break up with him. Yeah. So it was like March of 2016. How far, timeline-wise, um, how far from the point of meeting him to the point of he's now being cut off, has nothing, giving everything back, and now you need to financially support him? Uh, timeline-wise, where is that? It, it, was, it was not right away. I mean, because we met in July, and I started financially supporting him, I think, I don't know if it was November. Okay. So it wasn't, like, for quite a few months, he was teaching tennis lessons mm -hmm. and doing, you know, and he would pay for meals, and it wasn't. And I'm the one that offered, because I saw him, like, driving back and forth on the 405 and exhausted and having no time to study. And mm -hmm. I just wanted to give him, like, a chance to be able to finish. And I thought, you know, once he gets his residency, he'll be doing well. He can take care of himself. Mm -hmm. And, so. and you love this guy so much, and you share a very intimate detail in your book that yeah. um, you lost your virginity to him. I did. And I was I was a, one of those unicorns in, in L.A. <laughs> one of like, I mean, I would, it would be so awkward when people were talking about their sex lives, and mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't know, I've never done it. So, I mean, now I'm in the club, but like back then, I you know, I... I don't know if I was waiting until marriage. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, I am religious, but I've never been, I don't know. I would just, I wanted to find, like, the right person sure. or yeah. when it felt right. And everyone else in the past, I was like, oh, God, no. <laughs> yeah. So I think, you know, I, I did, he was the first person that I had slept with. And knowing what you know now, yeah. do you regret it? No, because I, I wouldn't have had my son, which we'll get to. But I think that, you know, I, I, how can you, you can't. If you met him, you get it. Like, mm -hmm. I, I would go through everything a <laughs> hundred times just to have him. So yeah. I think that, you know, you can't, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Sure. And I can't look back and say, oh, I wish I wouldn't have been in this situation because then I wouldn't have had him. Mm -hmm. Well, and can I say, by the way, listening to the audio version of your book and yeah. you explaining the intensity that you were feeling in the moment, yeah. I think anyone that has ever been truly like in love and head over heels and yeah. uh, not to mention, I mean, it sounds like, you know, this great looking guy and, and very lustful feelings on top of it. Yeah. Um, so, Natural I mean, hormones are kicking right, in. Right, yeah. <laughs> and, and your yeah. description of uh, finally taking the plunge is hilarious too yeah. um you know you got to listen to the audiobook if you have <laughs> it, i don't go into too much detail i right, didn't say sure. i'm not 50 shades of gray no 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 i just i like i wanted people to understand like if you don't understand how i'm feeling how would you understand anything sure so i mean i just wanted everyone to understand my mindset and what i was thinking absolutely okay so uh you come to find out that because he mentions it um he may have these mafia ties yeah. or, or organized crime. Yeah. And um, the, the red flag starts to, to raise a little bit. A little yeah? bit. Yeah, but yeah. He, he told me that he'd never been in, like, he never killed anyone. He said, he, I've done some money laundering, like, you know, snuck into some places, stole, stole a stamp, like, got something so we could transport something, some smuggling. Like, but he's like, I've never hurt anyone. I've never. And I thought, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I. Ugh. Like, anyone else is probably watching right now and going, run, run. But, like, I had been with him for all those months and saw what I thought was a really good person before, like, the verbal abuse had started. And I don't know. I thought, like, everyone should be allowed a chance to change. Mm -hmm. That's a, a very forgiving and very huh. diplomatic approach. Sarah. That's very yeah. Nice. yeah. Well, and it's somebody that you love. I totally get yeah. it. Like uh, you, you want to see the best in in who you love, yeah. and you want to believe the best of who you love. And yeah. um, so I totally understand that. And um, I, I certainly hope you don't feel like there's Not any judgment all. going on or no. anything like that. Because when I, I heard the story and when I read through it, I remember thinking. Love blinds everything. Yeah. I mean, love really does. I mean, that, that old cliche of the love but is I mean, blind. And I mean, there was, like, you know, like I said, he, he had the ID badge, he had photos. So everything he said, there always was something to back it up or some photo or some email or some website or some, you know, my family, you know, has this, like, furniture company. Here's their jobs they've done. Here's photos of it. So it wasn't that I was taking things just at, at words value. Like, there was actual what I thought evidence. Mm. <laughs> You find out you're pregnant. I do find out I'm pregnant. Mm -hmm. In New York, and then you mentioned there you, you took a, a million tests to make sure. Five, yeah. <laughs> so you go through all the testing, yeah. and you realize, oh my gosh, it's happened. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> and you mentioned there earlier that you're thinking about breaking up at I that I was point. ready to break up with them, yeah. And the, but then I was like, you know, he's the father of my child. What do I... And I felt like I owed it to my, you know, like the little thing in me. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, but that was rough. Like, once I found out I was pregnant, I didn't talk to Milos for months. Like, we kind of stayed in separate rooms. And, like, I was so sick. I had really bad morning sickness. So anything would set me off. Like, cologne, any, like, like the smell of coffee, the Louie, the dog. I had to put towels underneath the door. I would just vomit. <laughs> if I smelled him, like, I, I was really sick. Get out of here, Louie. Yeah, yeah, but... He was smelly little. But I mean, but bulldogs too. A lot of times, this this is just random. But they get like a fungus on their fur, and I like they just do naturally. That's why they get like spots. They're because they're just like you know they've been inbred a lot, Mm -hmm. so that's why they're so cute. But like they have a lot of skin issues or whatnot, and I think my pregnancy hormones, I heightened sense. I could just smell. He just smelled even more musky to me than he should. So just smelling him, I would go and vomit. Didn't matter if we washed him more often or whatever. He just, I was really sick. So. Milos was still studying at this point, and then um, he told me that he was going to, all of a sudden there was like, you know, it was about my third trimester, he's going to get the money out of this fund in Russia that he had, that it had been sanctioned. So when he got out of the, the, the I mean, once he started getting the money, then he wanted us to start looking at really high-end real estate. Mm. So he's like, you know, we can now, like, you know, things are going to be great now. Like, we'll go get a beautiful house. Like, and we'll go somewhere where there's clean air for our son. <laughs> and at that point, we knew we were going to have a boy. So we started looking at, like, multi-million dollar homes in Malibu. And you cannot look at these homes without proof of income. Right. So we had, like, you know, a sheet of paper that showed all the, he said he was getting $10 billion. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but he had the, the she. I mean, the realtors like looked legit to them, and they had, took us to go look at these places. And then he's like, "Well, really, like it'd be better for in San Diego. Like it's cleaner. There's four hospitals I can get a residency at. I'll have my boards done di- by December, or like you know, my son was due, or it was like by like you know the first week he was going to take the last mm-hmm. board or the first board, and then he would be done pretty quickly. So our plan was to get down to San Diego. So. I put my house up for sale. This is like my first home. And um, I was in debt also from being so sick and not working all these months. And about this time too, we started vlogging. It was Milos's idea. He's like, well, you know, why don't we just start filming our lives and putting that up? Like people like reality TV, like let's do that. That's fascinating to me that yeah. he would want to push stuff out. Yeah, he, but I mean, and, and I'm not, a, I'm not, people may not know, but like most of my videos on my channel are not vlogs, right. like they were the past few years, but mm-hmm. I did music video, co- like parodies, right. comedy stuff, like I kind of like to hide behind a character. Yeah, I was going to say, you song. were a character yeah, for as I long did. as I ever knew you, yeah. you know, as the YouTuber. And I didn't, yeah. I was very rarely that I put out a vlog, it was right. more when I was desperate, like going on vacation, <laughs> just wanted to make a video, and I was like, okay, well I'll just film whatever I'm doing and cut it together, but yeah. I just, I, I always like the challenge more of making bigger productions, so... It was, it was not like my choice or idea to go and start vlogging. What do you think the motivation was then for him to want to do something like that? Because I think I needed to start making money because I was going broke and I think that, you, you, know, you think that's why? That he just, he was like, well, this is an easy revenue stream. Like, this will, this will kick well, me something. I mean, maybe. if I'm paying all the bills and I'm not making money, then I need to get back to work. So like, but <laughs> I, I, think, I would worry that, yeah. I don't mean to catch you up, but I yeah. would worry that um, that would, you know, if, if you put yourself in issues, he, he's full of lies and deceit, and we'll get to that. Um, but I mean, we'll get to why. We'll get to the mental why. Sure, but like that would expose him. You know, like no, but like, to, but there's, but there's. So, so we'll there's get something to you figured that. it out. Yes. Okay, but I'm fascinated well, I mean, yeah. to hear this. Okay. Like, yeah, we'll get to that. There's good, a good. reason why it would be attractive to yeah. be online or be in front of the camera. Got it. So, okay. so take take me back because I think maybe yeah. we missed okay. something here, and that okay. is um, the first time you tried to kick him out. Yeah. I think we jumped over that. I mean, it was, yeah, it was right before we started looking at houses, before I was getting money. Yeah, the first time, I was like, when you're pregnant, you have really bad pregnancy hormones sure. sometimes. <laughs> and I was just like, you know, I was done with him. I was like, you know what, I'm paying all the bills. He's not, you know, he's not the love of my life. I'm pregnant. What am I doing? <laughs> so I went and started grabbing black trash bags from the kitchen, and I started packing up his stuff. And he came in and saw what I was doing. I'm like, he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm like, you're, like, you need to leave. And he, like, started grabbing the bags for me and mm-hmm. got in my face and, started chasing me around the house and at that point I knew I probably needed to call 911 yeah. just because uh, it, th- there's if anyone that's been in a, an abusive or a violent situation you know when someone switches and it's like this like they're not them anymore and you know it's dangerous mm-hmm. so I went to try to get my phone and call 911 and he wrenched the phone out of my hand hurt my pinky he had overextended it because he like ripped it out of my phone uh, the phone out of my hand and then I went to the living room because where I was at, the houses are really close together. Mm-hmm. So you can see in my living room from the neighbor's places, it's L.A. So mm-hmm. all the houses yeah. are crammed together. 
and my neighbors were in their yard every single day in the afternoon with their few kids like playing soccer and I thought if I just go to the living room they'll see me and I was like screaming like help me help me because Milos at that point you know had my phone so he took and he pinned me and then I was trying to I was only a few feet from the door to even get out and I went to push him off me and he was like my eye my eye you hurt my eye and then I was super confused because I thought, you know, here I was the one being hurt, but then all of a sudden I hurt him mm -hmm. trying to get away from him. Right. He's like, oh, you know, I'm a doctor. I need my vision to be able to see. And he like, you know, he grabbed his stuff and I'm like, I'll, I'll go with you. Like the, like the doctor's office He's like, no, no, I need to go. I need to go now. And he left and then came back with like an eye patch and drops. And they said like his cornea was detached or like something was going on. And that was really hard for me because I didn't understand like, I, I think anyone that's in the situation should, at that point, walk or call the police mm -hmm. because it doesn't matter if you hurt someone after they're trying to hurt you. Yeah. But if you're sensitive like me, it's hard because mm -hmm. I thought I hurt him. Yeah. And I was like, I, I don't know, it, then it all a sudden became my fault. Like, oh, because I'm pregnant mm -hmm. and I have all these hormones and whatnot, even though I was trying to get away. Does that even make sense? Sure. Uh, so so mm -hmm. now we're back to um, you, have, <coughs> you have now found a place to live. So. Well, yeah, so, yeah, we, um, then, then it was, like, a, after we started looking at houses, then Milos changed again and was being really nice, because he's all excited, because he's, like, getting, you know, money out and can financially support himself, mm -hmm. and he turned back into more than Milos that when I first met him, mm. which is, it's intoxicating when someone has that kind of charisma and they're mm. happy, so, um, I started to, like, see this life, where I'm like, oh, cool, we're gonna, like, you know, we're looking at this house, and look at this beautiful yard, we can put a place at here, my son can have sleepovers and this thing, or that would be a great room for him to have, like, you know, like, you know, his boy time, or, like, his man cave, and I started to buy into that fantasy. Yeah. And then when we, um, got to the point where there was one we really liked, that we were gonna put an offer in, in Rancho Santa Fe, my house was on the market, it was pretty much sold. We were on our last, like, open house day. And Milos came, I was starting to pack up. No, that was, sorry, the house was already sold and I was, because I was packing up. And while I was packing, Milos came in and told me, there's something I need to tell you. And he said, the banker ran away with the money. <laughs> so he's like, but, you know, don't worry about it. Like, my, their business partner's mom are on it. They're going to, like, find this guy. But for the moment, we can't put an offer on this house. And I'm like, I'm selling my home that I love going to San Diego, but I'm like, but wait, we're not going to, we're going to have to move back into an apartment or move. That's not, I didn't want to have a big, like I wanted to nest. Like mm -hmm. I was in nesting mode. I wanted a room like where I could put like a crib and create, you know, and it wasn't ideal, but I thought let's just go like keep going down to San Diego. Milo should get his residency, like keep going with the plan. Cause it was never about money mm -hmm. from the start for me. Right. So if we're not getting billions of dollars, fine. What are we going to do just to take care of ourselves and, you know, make our own way in life. So, we get down to San Diego, and then um, that's when I found out. It was, like, right before my birth. My mom helped us move. I sell my house. Then I find out Milish was watching porn my entire relationship. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> sorry. Can I, yeah, yeah, go okay. for it. So through a very unique um, series of events where uh, your mom just happens to be sort of gifted his laptop for the my day. My computer broke. Yeah. So I, my um, desktop computer broke. The hard drive needed to be replaced. So I was editing on my laptop. And normally the laptop in the house is our TV because I don't have TV. So my mom was there visiting and we didn't have cable. So she would, you know, use my laptop usually to go and watch something while I was editing. And I was yeah. doing a, a job for a... Um, garlic bread thing <laughs> so um while i was editing milo said well she can use my laptop so on milo's laptop she st started to type like youtube in the top and it started generating you jizz you porn and i was like well, she was britney get over here <laughs> and i remember like i'm like you know i was i was ready to burst like i was due yeah. like any day now it even the time, brand uh... even the brand we worn i may not be able to make the video because i might go into labor no. but i will try like you know i'm overdue right now mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I was sitting in the chair, and I remember I went to where my mom was on the bed, but when I look back in Milish's history, there was nothing, like, that would be out of place for the past couple of days. It was, like, his, you know, USMLE testing stuff, like, news sites, stuff like that, but when I just typed sex into the search bar, it populated stuff for literally my entire pregnancy. Like, every night when he was studying, like, he was studying, but just not what I thought he Right, was yeah, yeah. And... I, you know, that created World War II or World War III in our house between my mom and him because my mom thinks there's, like, sanctity around pregnancy. And mm -hmm. there's nothing, you know, if people watch porn, fine. But, like, I was pregnant while he was studying. Like, every single night he's just, like, you know, off, like, doing interactive kinky stuff. Yeah. Like, that's a little weird. So 
my mom hated him and I wanted everything to smooth over because his mom was coming in for the birth and it was only like, you know, a week or something before she came. And you had met her before. I had met her, but not, I met her, yeah, I met her, well, I met her the once, but she stayed a long period during Mm -hmm. that time, but she was staying with a friend, not at our house. And like, I had no issues with her. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just didn't really know her. She doesn't, you know, she's, her English was, you know, so-so. And, you know, I, Mila should be the translator a lot. And I thought she was nice. I mean, a little, like a little possessive over her son, but I didn't have any issues with her, Mm -hmm. you know, coming over. If anything, anything, I was excited to have like a big support group and like have a family, you know? And um, when she got in, that's like the moment that everything change yeah. and it got it got really weird like mm-hmm. around my birth is when like my life no longer it just it had no I didn't understand what was going on she became like possessive over your the, pregnancy the first thing she said when she saw me when the Milo said he because Milo went to get her at the airport but uh-huh. I didn't go with him so right. I don't know where they picked I don't know uh-huh. so um, I, I remember that my mom decided to, like, they both put up, put up white flags. They're going to, you know, be nice. As I said, I just want to get through and have a nice birth. I need you guys to get along. I need everyone to be happy. I need my mom to, like, not stay in her room that she's staying all day and, like, talk to us. I need, like, I need everything to be fixed. So they all agreed, you know, because I'm pregnant and they want to put stress on me just to, like, smooth things over. So Milos went to get his mom. The first thing she says when she sees me is, where's my grandson? Where's my grandson? And I'm thinking... Well, I can't help when he's going to come out. He's there. <laughs> he's not out yet. So um, that I remember that night we ended up, because I didn't have enough kick counts, we ended up having to go to the hospital the first night. Yeah. I didn't put that in the There's so much. But I didn't put that in the, the book. But we went to the hospital the first night just to check and make sure he's fine. And the mm-hmm. moment they put the straps on, like, he's no, 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 no. I'm like, kid. Because they make you, during your pregnancy, count kicks. Yeah. So if you don't get enough kicks, then they then the, um, you have to keep going to the hospital to make sure the baby's okay. Mm-hmm. And he, you know, Misha at the time um, was just like going nuts on my stomach every day and I never had to worry. <laughs> but then the moment she flies in that day, he was still. But yeah. they just got, it just got weird. I was being watched like, you know, every every second up until the birth. And she was like, where is he coming? Where is he? Where's my grandson? Yeah. And then you have the child. I have the child. You have uh, Misha. Yeah. Misha. Yeah, yeah, as you called him at the well, time. Well, he right? told me he was his, like his grandfather's name and he wanted our son to have a Serbian name. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I was, I, you know, I had gone through a lot of verbal abuse in the one, like, so I was pretty controlled at that point. And yeah. I wanted to please him and... I mean, yeah, I was in a mindset where I, you know, I just, I, I, my identity was not my own. Mm -hmm. And so now, yeah, Misha has been born and Milos's mother becomes this ultra crazed possessive over Misha character. Yeah. No, I mean, from like the moment, like, like I didn't do anything right. So I couldn't put diapers on right. Nothing I was doing was correct. Right. He was a little heater when he was born. He didn't want, you know, and they said it was fine at the hospital, like, because they just swaddle them when they're born. They don't put clothes on right away and then swaddle them. Like, Mm -hmm. you watch their, like, you know, see how their temperature is doing. And he, even now, gets all sweaty at night. He's just a warm kid. Mm -hmm. So when he was first born, if I put clothes on him, he would get really sweaty. His hair would get all matted. And my instinct said, just swaddle him and, like, you know, let it be and keep checking on him. Make sure he's warm. And she's like, no, he needs clothes. He's going to get sick. He's going to get sick. And whenever she would take him from me, she'd go put clothes on him. And then he'd be fussing and all upset. And I'm like, I'm telling you, this kid, like, he doesn't want clothes right now. And we were having a really warm winter in San Diego. So it wasn't, you know, I, yeah, and I, I, mean, I was doing the right thing. And then... I remember, like, you know, when, the first time we gave him a bath, like, I didn't do that right. Or, mm-hmm. you know, I need to wash him a certain way. And she kept taking him from me and calling him, like, my baby, my baby. And then when they were around, they only wanted photos, even from birth, of just my son. Like, she never wanted a photo of, like, Milos, me and the baby. Like it was you didn't just exist. Misha. I didn't right. exist. Uh. I no longer was of any importance. Like, and I, I kept thinking, I'm like, I felt like a heifer. I felt <laughs> like they just got me pregnant, and I was the brood, brood mare, brood cow, and here's your... Kit, like it was, it was a very weird situation. And at one point, you come across uh, Milos and his mother uh, in her room or his oh, room. Oh, but the, from the moment that my son was born, he started sleeping in her room. Right. He stopped sleeping in the room where the crib was because, like, you know, we'd read all the articles and knew that, like, you know, it was better these days for the crib to be next to the bed and to have the baby in the same room. So it was Misha and me in the one room, and he would sleep in his mom's room. With and her. They are oddly close. It was just, 
I mean, she just, any women that I was around with Milos always treated me like that I was the jealous, like the jealous girlfriend. Mm -hmm. They're always really catty or even the women he like taught tennis to. I remember we went to lunch with one and she was just not, like everyone had a, I don't know what was going on. I can't say, but right. like, like they all like, you know, felt possessive of Milos and huh. like I was competition or something. How, how, how strange. Okay. Uh, so, so let's, let's move ahead a little bit okay. here. Um, we get to a point where... Um, y it's basically your your mom is out. Uh, they refuse to have anything to do with your mother, and they are are adamant that um, you need to spend a little bit more time being appreciative of his mother, and your mom shouldn't even be there. Um, well, I mean, I ended up kicking his mom out first. Yeah. So that <laughs> I mean, it wasn't. It was just a really weird situation. She, you know, if you you can read about it in the book, like mm -hmm. exactly what happened, but like. It, it just it, enough was enough. I had just had a child. Like I, you know, was sweating and leaking from everywhere. And like you're a mess. Like when you just give birth, you're a mess. Mm -hmm. And I just needed support. I needed her to say, "I like the baby carrier. Really cute, right. good choice." Like I needed, I needed to have Something. like a supportive mother in a yeah. lot. And so I wanted to have a conversation with her, and that turned into like right away, like, "Well, should we leave?" And then her screaming at me like, "My baby, my baby!" And I got right in her face, and I said, "No, he is my son." And that's when she grabbed her stuff, and then she left. But not only she left, Milos went with her, and they took Louie. Mm. So now I'm in San Diego, like four days postpartum, and like living with my mom and the child, and then Milos is coming back like every day to scream at me or like just yell at me. Or I started taking notes because I think I knew at that point that that something was going to happen. So I would write down dates, times, what he said, and yeah, it was it was just getting really nuts. Yeah. And so what, I mean, I, I was gonna. I was at a point that I was going. I wanted to break up with him, but mm -hmm. then he told me that he had something wrong with him, and like that explained all his pain and everything that was going on. And so I, you know, believed Milos once again. And I thought, okay, well, it's time for my mom to go back to Arizona. Like I need to be a family with just Milos and Misha and figure out our lives, right? So my mom goes back to Arizona, but then the first day she left, we had our second incident of domestic violence where Milos was basically blaming me for his illness or the things that he's been going through. So at the same, it was like deja vu. Like once again, I'm trying to call 911. This time I wasn't going to announce it to him. Like yeah. I literally was going to get the phone. He hurt my pinky and then I um, went into the closet though this time and when, because um, Misha had spit up on me so I needed to change clothes. I had a legitimate reason and he, I'd gotten my phone back from him it was later in the day and I took photos of my pinky and it swelled like to three times. It ballooned. Wow. So um, I, I thought, and I changed my password right away on my lock screen and made it so he couldn't get into it and I thought, I, am I going to need these someday by chance? I don't know. So uh, when I was with Milos and he, you know, kept presenting that he had this illness and all these symptoms and it's things like, like I, I knew something was really wrong then. And they kept talking about getting Rex Bosnian Serbian citizenship and Milos needed certain, certain of my documents was what if he died. Like, Rex being your son, by the way, we haven't well, clarified yeah, yet. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, I later named name Rex. To, yeah, yeah, because I, later on he's legally now Rex. Yeah. But um, at, the t at that point his name was Misha. Mm -hmm. So... Um, uh, he, you know, wanted to get him Bosnian Serbian citizenship, which, which was making me really uncomfortable because mm -hmm. I thought, well, I looked at it up, and you only need one parent's consent to do it. Mm. I wouldn't even get notified if they applied for him to get citizenship. I won't be able to find out if they did. Oh my gosh! Like, let's say we went to Serbia, yeah. and I decided to come back. I'm not a citizen. My son's a citizen, and everyone else is. Like, they could probably just kick me out of the country and right. keep my child. Terrifying. So I, I kept telling him, like, no, he's an American. And I'm like, well, wait until he's older and he decides or I feel more comfortable because this is not. But then because he had this illness, he was on me and on me. Like, I want to put this apartment in Russia and this other building in Belgrade in Serbia in your name because if something happened to me, like, it'll be in a trust until our son's 18. Mm -hmm. And then, you, you know, if you need to access the funds, you can. Like, it'd be for his college, whatever. Like, he... The way he presented it is like, I, and he was on me about it. So finally, I, I mean, he wanted um, Misha's birth certificate and social security card, which is his right as his father to have that. So I relented, but then he kept wanting my passport and mm. wanting other stuff. And finally, and I mean, my mom and our friend Robert said, Brittany, don't do it. And then, but I, I felt like I needed to be all in or nothing. Yeah. And I was like, okay, well, he's so sick. He's throwing up all day long. Like, you know, he, you know, I can't put more stress on him. If he needs this, I'm going to do this for him. So I gave him my passport, like a copy of it. Mm -hmm. 
but then I figured out that he wasn't sick. Mm -hmm. And it was because I started researching online the like disease that he said he had and the symptoms and, ha and like he wouldn't let me come to the treatments, which made sense at that point because I had a brand new baby and the last thing you'd want to do would be take a baby to a hospital sure. around germs. Yeah. Like you don't even really want to take a baby around people for the first month because their immune system's building. Mm -hmm. So he's going off to treatments while I'm home alone with the kid and just kind of texting and getting, you know, how's it going and the two drugs that he said he was on, I finally researched how they were administered because I thought, you know, he didn't want to go to like where there's better hospitals. Mm -hmm. Like he was going to this one in San Diego that like, like did not have a good track record with mm -hmm. the disease that he said he had. I was like, why are we not in Texas? Why are we not in New York? Why are we not going if your you know, mom is paying for your treatment? And why, not, why are we not going where there's the best doctors? And then I figured out that how the drugs are administered is by IV, and there was not a mark on his body. Hmm. And I, you know, I was in the hospital just for giving birth. Like I had a purple mark in black and blue where the IV went into my hand. And if you were having regular treatments with these drugs that are only administered by IV, where is the proof? Right. And I, I think that's the point where I knew I had to get out, and I started to go, who am I with? And the, the detective later um, that was working on your case, you know, you had asked him, um, how would someone exhibit sort of the symptoms that you had been seeing from him? And yeah. the detective had a very interesting answer, something that people need to read in the book. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, the court case, you, it, it, this guy, whoever he really is, um, ends up being uh, taken to court. You take him to court. For the, a trial. for the when he hurt my hand, even mm. though it was a long shot, yeah. because I normally on domestic violence or whatever you need to report it right away. Mm -hmm. They did not like it when you wait a week, a month, forget it. Like why didn't why did you wait a month? But right. I waited a month and a half. Yeah. But the police officer grilled me, and he believed me because mm -hmm. I explained. I'm like you know at that point, Milos had also told me that he had killed people. He'd seen like heads in soup and bodies nailed to the wall that he got his degree mm -hmm. in forensic pathology so he could learn how to kill people and get away with it because he told me when i met him he had a master's in forensic pathology mm -hmm. so and he would show me like this his professor who was like oh he's like the he's like the csi guy of serbia like of the belgrade and show me and show me emails and show him their friends on facebook like it wasn't just me like the, there was evidence mm -hmm. so um I, you know, at, at that point, explained to the police officer what was going on. We basically, you know, made a plan, got, went to L.A. for legitimate work, and then I broke up with Milos. Came back, my birth certificate was stolen. Um, had to file another police report for that. And then I ha called the police, they came in, and then I got a temporary restraining order. So the, pol the police officer took my report, and then I had to go to the courthouse and then talk to, a, like, um, it's like a paralegal that's mm -hmm. at the, the courthouse, and yeah. then they submit that to the judge. And then I'm like, okay, now I have to go through a trial to try to get a restraining order against Milos because I, you know, with his ties, I wasn't sure if that would protect us, but at least it'd be a paper trail. God. I thought it's something. I mean, what, what yeah. was I gonna do? Right. I mean, I, I didn't know. I couldn't like take. I couldn't take our son and just like leave the state because then I would be kidnapping our mm -hmm. child. Sure. Because there's even in California, they still have rights even if they're not, you're not married or whatever. Like they still have. Every parent has a right to their child. Yeah. So I had to do things correctly through the legal system and wait. And the judge actually gave me permission to leave California and go out of the state with our son because the, the restraining order protected Misha as well until it was finalized, just during the temporary, during the trial. But the trial ended up being five days over five months. And it was like 15 hours yeah. of, yeah, I had, I had, there was multiple people that testified, including Bunny, like the girl that he told me that he was cheating on. Yeah, what I found out after I left him is what was terrifying. Like, yeah. like he did cheat on me. Mm -hmm. The woman that he told me that he had married for the green card, no, she was his wife. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the only thing she would tell the private investigators, I thought he loved me. Wow. That's the only thing she would say. And then she left for Russia. So she really was, she was another Russian. So she left, nothing against Russians. I'm just saying, like, she, you know, like, it was interesting. Um, right. Uh, so, but no, she left for Russia, deleted all her social media when she got contacted by the private investigator. And then I was like, okay, he told me he was like a professional tennis player, right? I went and there is a Milos Mihailovic on Google, but it's not my Milos and he's a different age. Mm. And then he told me he composed music and went to like a musical academy, right? There's a Milos Mihailovic that's a music composer online that he also showed Bunny and said that he was that person and tried to present that like he, those compositions were his, mm. but it's not him. Mm. So I, I, at this point, it was hard because I didn't know if his name was really Milos right. or, you know, he told me that he was a doctor. I don't know mm -hmm. because, like, he's not board certified. He, the, he only had the, like, the, 
the his diploma, whatever it was, like a Xerox thing. It wasn't even like the official thing. Mm -hmm. And even the judge says, I don't know. Like, I'm not sure in 15 hours if you are a doctor. I don't know. Like, maybe you went to medical school, medical school. Like, I think you did that. But everything else might be a technicality. I don't. So, I mean, that's what's scary about my situation. There's not, like, a finality. It's, yeah. like, that I still don't have answers. And people like that are out there and they're just doing it again. What <sighs> does something like this, an experience like this, a book worth of, of a story, a lifetime original movie of yeah, a story. Uh, like we were, when we were walking in, I said my yeah. life was like a telenovela. Like yeah. it was like unbelievably crazy. What what does that do to your mental health? I mean, you oh, you wrote about multiple times how you were just in tears constantly. I mean, you were just an emotional mess throughout yeah. most of this relationship because of the way he made you feel. Yeah. Um, how have you been able to bounce back, have you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's taken time. Like when I first left, I was a mess, but I I was in the flight mode and protect my son mode. So when I first got out, I was like mama bear, like I'm gonna take care of my child and I need to be strong and I need to like, you know, build my case and get the restraining order. And it wasn't until like everything was settled, like custody was settled where, you know, I got full custody and like the court was really strict. Like he can't, he has to come to wherever I'm at and has to be supervised, he has to pay all the fees. I can move anytime I want. Like I, it ended up being the best case scenario, but I think it wasn't until all of that was finished that I really realized what a mess I was. Because <laughs> then, like, I'm not fighting anymore. Now what? Yeah. I'm left with all the, you know, where I lost everything. Mm -hmm. Like I lost my friends, like my house, my life. I, you know, moved here when I was 18, mm -hmm. and I now I'm in Arizona, and I didn't know. I just didn't know who I was anymore. Yeah. So I think that was just a big journey. And I just made a video talking about PTSD. So yeah. I struggled with that and. It, you know, just different things would have triggers where I would just start sweating or have flashbacks or, you know, I'd, I had a, really like a lot of issues with just socializing or being out in public. So I think the biggest thing was just, you know, you keep living your life. And I've had such a great kid that's <laughs> helped me heal a lot. And I'm sure there's always going to be something like I won't trust like I did before. But I mean, I, I would say now I'm probably like 95 percent. I mean, there's going to be like anything. There's always going to be parts that are broken that may not be fixable, but I don't feel like it's anything that would be detriment detrimental to my life. Mm -hmm. Good. I'm, I'm very happy to hear that Thank you've you. been able to rally back. And well, no, I'm a mom. And yeah. like, I, my kid needs the best version of me. Like, mm -hmm. even when I was really upset, I would hide it from him. And, like, that's why he's such a happy, crazy thing, because, mm -hmm. like, you know, you like the, the, like, the first five years are so important for them. Yeah. And you managed to not only... Um, rally back the best version of yourself, I think, given the circumstances, but um, you have made lemonade out of these lemons, so yeah, that's I would for sure. I the biggest glass I could. <laughs> yeah. Uh, tell me, where can people find this book, and how can people uh, find out more about you? Sure. Um, the, one of the easiest ways is just a suckylovestory.com, because it has links to everything. So mm -hmm. if you want Kindle or Amazon, Barnes & Noble, it's on Audible. So if you want to listen to me, tell the book. For like eight hours, you can. It's so um, worth it. Yeah, it's an iBook. To listen to it. Yeah. It's so worth hearing you tell the story. Thank, yeah, there, I mean, there's just, there's multiple ways. I mm -hmm. mean, even like if you're in another country, I see some on eBay too, where people bought and then like can ship to, if they don't carry it in your mm -hmm. country or, or whatnot. But probably the easiest if you're in another country is just eBook. Okay, very good. Um, thank you for taking the time out of your day to come and be a Thank part of this and for, for sharing this story over and over again. Uh, I know. Because it's so important that everyone hears the, the type of person that um, you thought was the love of your life for a certain period of time. But going back just to the video thing, do you want mm -hmm. me to explain why? Oh, please. Because like, I figured out that my ex was a sociopath yeah. and the, the, one of the behaviors, they like limelight and they like... So he liked the whole like YouTube thing, and mm. he liked the whole like attention, the exposure. And the, and yeah, the... yeah. So if that's not. Boy, is that creepy. It's not, yeah, but that's not. That's why I'm saying like, it's not. He he very much enjoyed it. So I mean, he filmed a lot of the things, and a lot of the things that we went and did were his ideas. So. And the whole time that your life is hell these videos are coming out and things are looking great. You know, things are looking quite comfortable. But I mean, I, but I didn't, I didn't start filming until after the first time he had hurt me and it was like, it was when we were going to look at houses. So it was like a small little pocket of like happy time. We're like, we're back on track. He's going to finish his boards. Mm. We're going to like get a cute little house and have a family. So you got to understand like those, those videos like were not the hardest part of our relationship. It was when it was a semi like good part. But even if when there, there was fights or him going after me, 
I only film 10 minutes a day or eight minutes a day and there's 24 hours right. in a day. Sure. So there would be moments where I would have a, like things that would be awful and then we'd talk for hours and then I'd pick up a camera and film. And at that point, I may just look tired, but mm -hmm. you didn't know the subtext or what was happening. Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh, there's always more to a story. Than, yeah, you than cannot, do not trust daily vloggers. Yeah, no kidding. It, because there's so much you hide. Because mm -hmm. you just don't want to involve people in your personal life. Absolutely, yeah. Well, um, it's the new Brittany Taylor. I know. And, uh, and, <laughs> and Yeah, and, and you are back and better than ever and stronger than ever. Um, and thank you for being who you are. Oh, thank you. And for you. having the courage that you do because this book is uh, so powerful. And for anybody that's ever been victimized, for anybody that's ever been hurt, um, this is a book that uh, you absolutely need to pick up. And if you have the opportunity to listen to the audiobook, absolutely incredible. Thank you for being a part of the broadcast today. If by chance you have an interest in the Millennial Report, head on over to MillennialLive.com. You can also uh, link up with me if you'd like. I'd love to meet your acquaintance at Wade Wire on Facebook, Twitter, and the Instagrams. And uh, I'm always looking for feedback. If you have anything that you'd like to share, please send it our way. Uh, we leave you now with uh, one of Brittany's videos, a very uh, powerful one, uh, in which she talks a little bit about uh, not only this experience, but uh, the story in general. We will see you next week with uh, family therapist Katie Morton. She will be joining us right here to talk about mental health um, and the ramifications of not having a good mental health. So we will see you next week. Thanks for being part of the broadcast today. Hey guys, this video has been a long time coming. One year, three months, and 27 days of having to be silent, but Who's counting? I have felt every moment of it and having to be silent has been one of the hardest things I've ever had to do, but I'm hoping by the end of this video, you will better understand why. Let's first focus on the things that most of you already know. I was in a relationship with a man named Milos Mihailovic from July of 2015 until March of 2017. Found out I was pregnant, shock of my life, in March of 2016, and I made a video called I'm Engaged and Pregnant in July of that very same year. I thought that I had found the one and I was in love and having a child and I wanted everyone to know. Milos wanted me to tell people that we met at a coffee shop, but the truth is we met on Tinder. Oh, Tinder. <laughs> Much of our relationship played out online and in vlogs and it was peachy and rosy and I kept a lot of things hidden that were scary and bad and I kept them very light and there was a lot that I was hiding. I have mentioned before in videos that for legal reasons I have not been able to talk about what happened to me, but what I failed to mention is that I had a lot of court trials involving Milos that didn't wrap up until February of this year. One of which I am sure many of you have read on gossip forums was for domestic violence. I'm so sorry, I'm just, it just been a lot. Not yet, keep it together. Ah, uh, keep it together. I was ordered by a judge during such trials to not talk about my situation until a ruling had been made. So I had no choice <laughs> because anything that I would have said in a video or on a post could have been used against me. And I had to make sure that Rex was with me and that he was safe. The stakes were just too high. When all the trials were done and everything was settled and finally over, you think I would have been finally able to talk about what happened to me. <laughs> Wrong. There were and still are many legal impediments or roadblocks, if you will, as to why I can't safely talk about what transpired. After much consideration and expert advice, my only real option to be able to tell my story was to write a book and get a publisher behind me. For my trials, I had already organized everything into a folder. So I had dates of things that happened. I had police reports, receipts, witness statements, everything that I would need to factually back up the insane truth that was my life. And by the end of February this year, I had myself a book deal. It took me about a month to finish it. So I just sat on the couch right above my head, 
upstairs here and for eight to ten hours a day i just poured my heart to paper i give you a sucky love story overcoming